Yo, what's good everybody? Welcome to Unfair Sports, where we take a pensive approach to the sports conversation. I'm your host, Jay, along with my co-host, Jimmy. Make sure you check us out wherever you get your podcast, as well as on our YouTube channel. While you are there, rate us, review us, and give us five stars. You don't think we deserve it? Man, just give us five anyway. Gift it. So on today's episode of Unfair Sports, we're going to dive into the NBA Finals Game 3. The USA takes a big L in Nigeria. (laughs) Name, image, and likeness. Who do you think will make the most money? We're going to wrap things up with ESPN's top 10 quarterback list and figure out if ESPN got it right or if they got it wrong. Make sure you hit us up on the Unfair Fan Line, 430-901-1906, and leave us a message and let you let us know what you think about the show. Give us your uh, strongest opinions. If you want to write it out instead of speaking it out, hit us up on our YouTube channel. Go to unfair-sports.com, and while you're there, make sure you like, subscribe, and share, because why? Sharing is caring. Jam Master J is for horses. What's going on? <laughs> Jimmy, what it do? <laughs> Baby. Good man. Glad to, glad to be here. I'm glad to be here glad as you. well, man. It's gonna be it's, it's a good it's gonna be have a good show. We have a lot of more fun topics than we do your standard news and updates. This is gonna be the um I guess you could say the rating mm-hmm. type show, the where we basically <laughs> put together lists, the things that fans love that I despise uh-huh. because lists are so subjective and all it leads to is people getting mad. And I don't understand why people get irrationally angry when a list is put together that doesn't um I guess meet their standard. Exactly. I agree. It's they, they think that list actually dictates something when it dictates absolutely no, nothing. nothing. And it's just for fun because you never know what the outcome is going to be for the season. And, you know, get off my, my soapbox on that. But we're going to start off with, of course, this. The NBA Finals seem like they're getting a little interesting, Jimmy. I'm not sure if you noticed, but uh, we finally have a game that looked at first like it was worth well actually correction it lasted about one and a half quarters when it looked like it was worth something and then it just disappeared from there where Mm -hmm. the milwaukee bucks decided to beat up on the phoenix suns they won the game 120 to 100 um Giannis Antetokounmpo went out there and did some magical things scoring 41 with 13 boards Mm. he is one of I think six players in NBA history to have back-to-back 40-10 games Mm -hmm. leading up there with the LeBrons the MJs you know all of your legends in the game he uh, ascended to that level and he had one very interesting thing too he shot 13 for 17 from the free throw line. Yeah. So the counting thing that we're used to seeing that everyone on the road does, of course, the Milwaukee fans didn't do that. They hit him with the MVP chance. And I guess that got his adrenaline flowing and got him more confident because mm-hmm. he made 13 of his 17 free throws. Mm-hmm. So as we look at the way this game went and ask the question around this is, did – is it fair or unfair to say that the Bucks are still alive in this series? Or did the Bucks win this game or did the Suns <laughs> lose it? I'll go with the second one. I would say that it is totally fair to say that the Bucks didn't so much win this game as the Suns lost this game. Woo! First and foremost, the Suns scored 118 points in the first two games. And in this game, they get held to 118 points fewer than what they had scored in the previous two games. So for that reason, I mean, that's an example of how everything, it was just a perfect storm of everything the Bucs needed. What did they need? One, you needed to do something about Devin Booker. Well, he did something about himself. Shot three for 14 from the field, (laughs) 10 points. Didn't even play in the fourth quarter. Wasn't injured. Monty just decided not to play him, which I'm somewhat curious about. But either way, he didn't play. DeAndre Ayton. He did not dominate the glass, especially the offensive glass, like he did in the first two games. And he got himself into foul trouble early in the fourth quarter, gone for the rest of the game. And then CP3, who has essentially been the second best player in this series behind Giannis, honestly, had been allowed to, as he has for much of the playoffs, dictate the pace and the flow of the game. So they said, not this time, you little a-hole. You are not going to dictate anything about this game. And he didn't. Scoring 19 points closer to his season average of 16 or 17, as opposed to just some of the ridiculous scoring numbers that he's impressively put up in these playoffs. So 
neutralizing their big three, as well as getting the type of game that you got from Giannis, not even the 41 points, but going 13 of 17 from the free throw line, which shows you that the road crowd does get into his head and contribute to his poor shooting numbers from the free throw line. So when you get all that put together, mixed together, then it's easy to see that the Bucks are going to blow out whoever it is, whether it's the Suns or anybody else. So the Sun, the Bucks didn't win this game. The Suns lost this game. And Ooh, to me, man. it even feels like, even though it's now 2-1, it doesn't even feel like the Bucks have a victory in this play, in this finals. Because in order to, 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 me, to me to have a true victory, you've got to beat the Suns when the Suns play a really good game. And your game was just a little bit better. That's a... I mean, it still counts, obviously, in the win column. But, <laughs> yeah, I, saying, I don't think yeah. they're going to say that this doesn't count as right. a win. So I, contribute, definitely... so I contribute most of what happened in this game to the Suns losing as opposed to the Bucks really taking it from them and winning. Ooh, that's um, a very interesting take to hear that you believe that the uh, Bucks. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, I feel like the Bucks won this game okay. more than the Suns lost this game. So I'm the opposite. I think it's more fair to say that the Bucks did win this game comparison to the Suns uh, losing this game. Mainly because the Suns game plan going into this game, it seems like similarly to what other teams have done. And this was a complaint of Monty Williams. So going into at the end of the game, Monty kind of basically said, I'm going to paraphrase it, that I don't want to really complain, but our team shot 16 free throws and Mm -hmm. one of their guys shot 17. (laughs) (laughs) And that's his complaint. Mm. We also know who was the referee in that game, which is the key thing. Now, I'm going to say this about this. Okay. As much as we want to say about this guy <laughs> that was refing the game, which is Scott Foster, mm-hmm. Chris Paul is 0-12 now. He was 0-11 going into this game. He's 0-12 when Scott Foster is refereeing the game. Mm-hmm. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. But it does feel like in this game, it was more so because they were in Milwaukee rather than in Phoenix. This is why I say that. I went through and looked at the fouls and the free throws shot between the games, first game, game one, two, and three or whatnot. So in game one, Phoenix shot 26 free throws while the Bucks shot 16. Mm-hmm. Game two, the Suns shot 14 free throws, but the Bucks shot 23. Mm-hmm. The Suns still won. And then in this game, the Suns shot 16 free throws and the Bucks shot 26. Right. So, why am I bringing up how many free throws they're shot? So, the game plan that it seemed like they were doing in this is that if Giannis goes to the paint, what do you do? You foul him. Mm -hmm. You do not let him shoot easy shots. You foul him. Hence why a lot of their players were ending up in foul trouble. Makes sense, right? Yep. It don't make sense when Giannis is making 13 of 17 from the free throw line, which to me means it doesn't make sense to have that game plan of fouling in Milwaukee. It's not going to work. Like there was one sequence, somebody tweeted this out and I started paying attention to it more because I was just more so just watching the game because the game was getting out of hand. But when Jay Crowder was defending Giannis, he was up on him at the mid range. Why would you do that? That's not a good defensive play. Mm -hmm. Not to say Jay Crowder is not a good defensive player, but that's not a good defensive play. Mainly because if you take the advice from the Brooklyn Nets and the way they had things set up, Blake Griffin played defense on Giannis by not playing defense on him. Mm -hmm. He said, beat me with the mid-range. If you can beat me with the mid-range, you can win the game. Giannis wasn't able to. And it basically threw off Giannis' game to where he would try to drive, but Blake Griffin is known for taking charges. Mm -hmm. That's what Jay Crowder and him have to do in Milwaukee, especially if you expect for this discrepancy in free throws. So, Monty, I understand why you don't like the fact that they shot more free throws than you. Um, they shot more free throws than you in game two, and y'all still won. Mm-hmm. You know what? I think this is actually Chris Paul's fault, this discrepancy in free throws. Here's the okay. reason why. So Chris Paul goes into this game knowing that his most hated rival outside of uh, Rajon Rondo, we'll say. <laughs> Parmesan Rondo. Parmesan Rondo is Scott Foster. So he goes to his team being the leader, the vocal leader that he is, and he says, all right, guys, you know, like I know that Scott Foster hates me, therefore he's going to hate you. 
Don't rely on him to call anything. We're going to have to do this ourselves. So then what does the team do? They play less aggressively because when you play aggressively, part of what you're doing is, you know, if you don't get the shot, most likely in virtue of your aggression, you're going to get the foul call versus Scott Scott Foster with Chris Paul on your team. You are not going to get that. So because they play less aggressively, they probably got foul less, went to the line less. And that is, to me, a better explanation or maybe the explanation that Monty Williams is looking for as to why there was this disparity. So it's really Chris Paul's fault. I can see that. And looking at the, the disparity with this, Giannis shot 17 free throws. His team shot 26. That means anybody not named Giannis shot nine free throws total. Mm-hmm. The foul discrepancy, 24 for the Suns, 18 for the Bucks. So it looks like foul-wise, they weren't that far off. True. That's only six fouls in comparison between the two. And if the game was closer, it might have actually been closer with the foul stuff. But that was the biggest thing. It didn't. I didn't feel like Phoenix was attacking the rim as much as they normally do. Besides Cam Johnson yamming all <laughs> over PJ Tucker. Mm-hmm. I mean, he well, put him on his forehead. You know, when you say that, I really don't see Phoenix attacking the rim very much just in these playoffs. I mean, and why would you? If you've been successful and you made it this far, you don't have to be like even with DeAndre Ayton. I see him take more. I guess whatever is in between going into the paint in the mid range, I see him take a lot of eight nine footers. Yeah, I see Chris Paul. You know, he's he's a mid range god along with being a point god, so he yes. doesn't need to go in there. Devin Booker is a sharpshooter; he doesn't need to go in there either. Jay Crowder, I mean, he's the guy who's just sitting there waiting for the defense to play off of him or miss a switch or be late, and then he's open. And Mikael Bridges, I don't recall a single Mikael Bridges play, play in the last game, but that's beside the point. Right. So it doesn't seem like Phoenix, and I said this at the start of the series, Phoenix is more of a finesse team. Yes. The Bucks, they're more, you know, because of Giannis, because the shape of your team is going to be built around your superstar, they tend to be more physical between him, between Drew, between Drew Holiday, and occasionally Brooke Lopez. Yep. So they really aren't a go-to-the-paint team. If it's wide open, they're going to get there perfectly fine, but they're more of an outside shooting team. And that's mainly because of age. I mean, if you look at this, Cameron Payne's 26, Cameron Johnson's 24, Mikael Bridges is 24, DeAndre Ayton is 22, Devin Booker's 24. I mean, mm-hmm. you're only 30-year-olds. It's Chris Paul, Jay Crowder. Crowder and Tory Craig, a bunch of kids. Exactly. Whereas on on the flip side with Milwaukee, you're looking at everyone is over the age of 26, except mm-hmm. for Bobby Portis, mm-hmm. which is why I think the longer this series goes on, the more it starts to favor Milwaukee because of that age. veteran experience. Yeah. Age. Brooke Lopez at 32. PJ Tucker's 35. Good lord, I didn't realize He's he was 35, 35 years old. Uh, yeah, Drew Holiday's 30. I mean, they have more age, so I think that I can I can agree with you on that. It may lean more towards them as far as the experience goes, mm-hmm. and the young guys may be thrown off by the way the game is going. So, yeah. with that, looking at the free three throw discrepancy, which is the biggest talk of everything with this, Giannis shoots. 62%, 62.8% free throws at home. And he shoots 52% on the road in these playoffs. Mm-hmm. So to me, your game plan should not be to foul Giannis. <laughs> um, and there was a picture that actually was circulating around too of Giannis's arms. Dude was literally clawed up. Like literally was wets all over his arms. Yeah. That tells you that those were fouls. Yeah. Y'all were hacking him. And I, and I get everyone thinking that the league is soft. I need to do a video and talk about that. It ain't. <laughs> The difference between back then and today is they don't want people to have concussions. Mm-hmm. It's not fun watching people get concussions. Um, and at the same time, a lot of the players are so much bigger and stronger that if you don't tackle them you, it, it, or they quote-unquote flop, you'll never know they got fouled because their body is built to absorb a hit. Mm-hmm. So with Giannis, you can tell that he, he doesn't flop. He actually just flies through it. But with those webs on his arms and his body getting beat up, Come on now. They're family. They okay, have to. So let me ask you this. So if you're Milwaukee, do you think that confidence-wise, they're riding high in the sense that not only did we beat the Suns, but we destroyed him? Or are they thinking, man, the Suns played a crappy game? They're probably thinking that the Suns, A, played a crappy game, and B, they're young. Mm-hmm. We, need to keep, we need to keep our foot on the gas with that. Mm-hmm. That's probably the mindset. It should be the mindset. And, again, the – Bucks are going to bail out Bootenholzer in this one game. <laughs> it's funny. Jeff Van Gundy said this during the game. 
Uh, he said that uh, everyone talks down about Bootenholzer and his adjustments and things of that nature, or whatnot. Bootenholzer is a great coach. All he does is win. And I laughed. I was like, isn't that kind of like the knock on you, Jeff Van Gundy, <laughs> or that you weren't that good at adjusting? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that you didn't really win anything. <laughs> and that's why you didn't win anything at the end, uh-huh. is that people kind of okay. pointed that so part then, out. So he's defending his boy. No, he's defending himself. And exactly. That's what I'm saying. He's defending his boy, and he's defending himself. Yes. Realizing that everybody's pointing out the one thing that he kind of wasn't that great at. But with Bootenholzer, He's, he, he is being saved by the veteran presence because Drew Holiday has been awful. And you know what? With Monty Williams, too, doesn't he have the feel of a young coach as well? Because he had his first – no, correct me if I'm wrong. His first coaching job was the New Orleans Pelicans. Yes. Is that right? And that was only for how long? Five years. He was there five years? Yes. Monty was there for a while. It didn't feel like it was five years. It okay. didn't. Okay. It, but he was there for a while. Mm-hmm. He, he, he had a nice long stint mm-hmm. with them. But he never made the playoffs until this year. So he's like a playoff young coach. Yeah, he was uh, 2010, 2015 is when he was the coach there. Uh-huh. And then he was an assistant in Oklahoma City. And then the unfortunate thing happened with his wife. Right. Uh, and we lost yeah. him. Yeah. Uh, then he went to Philly for a year. And then he took over this job mm-hmm. here. So, yeah, he, okay, he had five years there. Yeah, so th- no, that, it was that one. Didn't they go to the playoffs once with Anthony Davis? Yeah. No, that was Alvin Gentry. That was Alvin. That was Alvin Gentry. He did okay, make so, the playoffs so with Chris last Paul. Time, it couldn't have been five years if Alvin Gentry – was the coach, right? The last when they had AD, wasn't Alvin Gentry the coach? Yeah, yes, because AD. he's the one. He's the one who played Zion in the, those meaningless preseason games and hurt his knee, which affected him throughout the season. Okay, so Monty Williams really is he is more of a young coach, or more of a young playoff. coach. He was coach of the New Orleans Hornets. Okay, that's how he far back H- 2010, 2010 to okay. twenty fifteen was what he was the head coach of the New Orleans Hornets slash Pelicans. He was there mm-hmm. for the rebrand, yeah, or whatnot, and so. Um, yeah, he he technically is is young. I mean, he was he went to he made it to the playoffs. He made it to the playoffs once. He was two and eight in the playoffs, actually twice. So he actually had a decent playoff. I mean, he didn't get past first round. Right. So this is his first deep run, which I'm happy for him because he deserves. Me so, too. Me too. Um, let's see what happens in game four. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we get some. Yeah, two 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 two. Give us a series. I need I need a series. I need to be a little bit closer too. The scores are kind of blowout ish. <laughs> right. There was a question that was asked, and I think this will be a great one for us if this does extend past uh, the next two games, which I think it should. I think we should get. We should probably have one more show before the finals is over. Yes. Um, and I will make sure to mention this on that show is, is this the worst NBA finals ever? <laughs> People have been wow. asking that question because of the blowouts. Every game has not been close after the third quarter. Mm-hmm. No. no. We'll, We've got options. For a later time. i got to think about that. Okay. We've got options. Other options that we have here on Mondays with Unfair Sports is the news. And now Jimmy has the news. Ah, thank you, Wendy. So, Jay, Shohei Otani of the L.A. Anaheim Angels uh, just keeps impressing us <laughs> this season. I, can, I never can tell if it's Los Angeles or Anaheim. Change the name like every um, other week. Though. It was announced today that he is going to start in the All-Star game. And you think, okay, what are you talking about? Of course he's going to start. He leads the league in homers. No, Jay. He's going to start at pitcher for the American League um, in this All-Star game. Coming up, I believe, tomorrow or the next day. As a matter of fact, I think the home run derby might be tonight. Um, so now with this ascension of Shohei Otani, albeit on the team with Mike Trout, who's supposed to be the best player in baseball, is Shohei Otani now the face of baseball? I think he should be. Uh, Stephen A. Smith is running into some uh, really bad press right now because of his statements around Shohei Otani mm-hmm. and the fact that he believes that he can't be the face because he needs an interpreter since he doesn't speak English. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the idea of Shohei Otani being the face because all you need to do is have his face and his numbers up. You don't really need him to talk. Mm-hmm. You know, baseball, it's a very, it's minimal when it comes to when it comes to language, when it comes to actually communicating because it's a very simple game in a sense. So it's not as needed as opposed to like a quarterback needs to communicate or a point guard or something something like that. So I think that even though he doesn't speak English or doesn't speak it very well or well enough, I think that he can still be the face of baseball because he's doing something that really we've never seen before. We've only heard of potentially being done with Beirut. So I think that if baseball has learned from their mistakes the last 20 years when it comes to poorly marketing their stars, I feel like they're starting to learn now more the impact that that can have. And I think that 
the Major League Baseball is a big part of the reason why he's actually starting in this All-Star game at pitcher, giving us something we didn't think we were going to see. Yep, and I think he's starting leading off at uh, batter, too. Probably. Yep. Exactly. Never been done before, never going to be done again, unless he does it. Yep. All right, so up next, over the weekend, Jay, we had UFC 264, headlined by Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier, and I can already see the expression on your face because you know what I'm about to say, whereas Poirier won by TKO in the first round due to McGregor being unable to continue because of a fractured leg, another one of those bad injuries to see, especially in slow motion, um, and especially in a fight this big. So uh, he's had successful surgery, yes, and he's got one win, Conor McGregor, in the last five years. So combining the two, have we finally seen the last of Conor McGregor in no, the UFC? No, for for and going after championships, yes. As far as like fighting other people, he could probably beat some of the other top ten fighters. Mm. But going for the actual titles, yeah, he's done on the titles, title hunt. Mm. I don't think he needs this. You know, go fight Jake Paul or Logan Paul. You know, that make, would be make dope. millions of dollars that way. Go make a hundred million dollars off a show like that. Right, exactly. Or, or fight Floyd Mayweather again. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. We're done with that. But either part. way, please don't come back to the UFC. You don't need it. You're beyond the UFC, and I'm tired of seeing you. Exactly. What's next? All right, lastly, I got a rumor for you, NBA rumors. So there's a rumor that the Warriors have discussed a trade for Damian Lillard, which to me is not a rumor because they discussed, they probably discussed a lot of different trades. But knowing that this probably is not ever going to happen, if you were the GM of the Warriors, what would you offer Portland for Damian Lillard? Well, you got to send Wiseman. Yes. Probably send Andrew Wiggins as well. Okay. The number four pick. Oh, no, number seven, seven pick. I'm sorry. Uh, not set, four. Seven. Number yeah. seven pick. Uh, is it? Okay. Well, we're on the same page. I would say I'll give you seven, and they have number 14 this year in the draft. Wiggins and Wiseman, those are the two I pointed out. I thought about Draymond, but he's the heart and soul of that team. They're not giving him up. And we'll give you our first round pick the next two years, which with Dame's not going to be worth anything. Exactly. But we'll still give it to you anyway because it looks good well, on it's paper. Currency. It's currency. So yeah. it's still 100 bucks. You just uh-huh. got to wait till you can spend it on. Right, right. So then you'd have a starting 5J of Dame at the point, uh, Steph at two guard, Clay at the three, Clay at the three, if Draymond at the four, and whoever at the five. Yeah, we don't care. Yeah, not gonna happen, but it'd be fun to see. That would be disgusting. Yep. I am not. I do not like that idea. <laughs> That's, it. That. That's, That's it. Is it? It's news. And that uh. was Jimmy with the news. Thank you, Bob. All right, Jay, so sticking with basketball, or at least I think that's what I watched (laughs) also on Saturday night, was the first exhibition game of Team USA versus Nigeria uh, from Las Vegas. Uh, The team headlined by Kevin Durant, Damian Lillard, Bradley Beal, and Jason Tatum. And in this first exhibition game, Team USA suffered a defeat by the score of 92-87 to Team Nigeria, who I believe shot like 50% from the three-point line. And if you know if any of you if you know the history and the lineage of USA basketball since the Dream Team, the expectation is that the team, whether exhibition or actually in the Olympics, win not only wins every game, but wins every game by at least 40 points. That's sort of the curse of all the teams that have come after the greatest team ever assembled in basketball, the Dream Team. So with that, Jay. Is it fair or unfair to say that Team USA should be worried after losing this game to Nigeria? I think it's fair. And I'm only saying it's fair because there's been a shift in basketball since the 92 Dream Team. 92 Dream Team was that the 92, the 96, and the the 2000 were probably three of the greatest Olympic teams ever created. I mean, 92 was the first year that they actually used professional players. Mm -hmm. And then you started to see the trickle of multiple players doing it. And uh, since then, and then of course we had, what was that? The 2004 team that was awful and got a bronze. Oh, because it was a team full of young guys going against veteran NBA players around the world. Mm -hmm. Then the redeemed team hitting 08 going on, so on and so forth. My point behind that is, is that, Overseas, those teams have evolved. They've gotten better. I mean, some of your top 10 players in the NBA are foreigners. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they should be worried because on this team, doesn't include all the top 10 players in the league. You don't have Steph. You don't have a LeBron. You ain't got Kawhi. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So, all the players that you really need, Devin Booker still ain't there yet Mm because he he ain't even – he's still in the finals. Uh, A lot of your top players that you would – that you need in order to make sure that we are leaps and bounds the best in the world Mm -hmm. are not going to play and aren't available. That's a big difference maker to me in what's going on. So, with Nigeria – 
the NBA, the, 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 the USA team is 54 and two since in exhibition games since 1992, 54 and two. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a number. I got that off of the article from ESPN and Nine years ago, they beat Nigeria by 83 in the London games. <laughs> Five years ago, they beat Nigeria by 43 in an exhibition game. Mm-hmm. They lost this one. Mm-hmm. I think we should be concerned. And I'm going to be I'm full disclosure on it. I didn't even watch the game because I had a feeling something bad was going to happen. <laughs> and then when I saw Kevin Durant get his shots just stuffed, that don't, that stuffed. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I did watch the entire game. And... In your opening take on this, I do realize whose fault this is. You're right about something. I do realize whose fault this is. This is uh, Steph Curry's fault. And I think this explains the reason why he decided not to join the team. Why is it Steph Curry's fault? Because as you talked about, the international game has evolved. It's evolved to, in a sense, turn into, or in a sense, maybe already somewhat was, what the game is now because of Steph Curry, which is essentially from the three-point line first in. So if Team USA playing that style of basketball that we now play goes into a game against an international team that also plays that style of basketball, if they shoot threes better than us, doesn't matter that we have Kevin Durant, we're going to lose. And that's exactly what happened in this game. Team Nigeria shot lights out from three point. 47.6%. They were 20 for 42. Jimmy, they shot 73 shots in the entire game and 42 of them were threes. But that's not what worries me. That worries me. That's not what really worries me. What really worries me is not even that they lost the game. It's that they only scored 87 points. Yeah, that was was pretty low. I don't care that it was an exhibition game. I don't care that it was your first exhibition game. In that game, okay, you may not know exactly... You know, your chemistry, how to play with each other, even some of the few plays that you would have at that point that Popovich and his staff have drawn up, you're not going to know those very well. But if you have, I mean, these are still some of the best ballers in the NBA. You should be able to muster more than 87 points against Team Nigeria. So you gotta, that worries me. Yeah, you got to remember, too, I, and I, I've, and this is the thing I've tried to tell other fans and stuff, is that you don't win championships, you don't win anything on paper. Mm. I mean, the roster can look nice. But if it don't mesh, yes. it ain't going to mesh. If, if it's not the top 1%, of the top 1%, mm. It ain't going to work. And I'm looking at this roster, man, and I mean, they're great players, but the fact that we don't have the top players in the NBA playing, I mean, mm-hmm. we ain't got Paul George on here either. Dang. Huh. I mean, that, but we shouldn't need them. Oh, yeah, we do. We sh- no, I'm saying we should not need we them. Should, no, we should, and that's my Why point. should we need them? Why do we need LeBron, Steph, and Paul George on this team when we have a KD, when we have a guy like Bradley Beal because that's or Lillard it. or Tatum. Because you've got that, – that, that was you just, you just named the four players. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> that's literally it. That's the team. I mean, I like Zach Levine. I don't know if Zach Levine is top 20 in the NBA. No. Yet. Um, I think he has the potential for it. But there's probably 20 players you'll pick before him. I don't okay, know. Unless you're, you're a Bulls fan. So you're saying these are B players. You're saying outside of Kevin Durant, these are B stars, we'll say. Outside of Kevin Durant, Lillard, and Tatum, these are B stars. These are B stars. They're not superstars. Right. Some of them have the potential to get to that point. There's gaps. And that's and that's the I guess that's the one thing that I, I think fans don't get when I try to explain this. And it makes them mad. It makes me even more mad if they get mad behind it is there's levels to talent when it comes to the pros. That's why certain players immediately walk in the league and start dominating. There's mm. levels to talent mm. that you have to recognize. And I mean, the Nigerian team, I don't really know. I don't know really any of these players for the most part. I know, I know, uh, Epke Udo, cause he played at, um, if I'm correct, either yeah. T, he played TU, either TU or RU. In his area, Jalil Okafor was uh, played on there. So he's from Oklahoma, exactly. Uh-huh. Played in Oklahoma. That's all that matters. Um, but for the most ta- part, they play like a team. Yeah. It looks You're like. Right. I mean, you could tell they've been playing together for a lot longer. And see. And then add insult to injury to this team is is that they didn't have very long to get together and, and try to get themselves prepared for this. Whereas everybody mm-hmm. else, unless you were in the playoffs, you mm-hmm. were prepping this entire time. Now, I will say one thing, and this should make Team USA basketball fans feel a little bit better. And you might recall this. Now, I don't know how official this game was. Not this game, but the game I'm going to talk about. But I recall that the first game the 92 Dream Team played together was, I think, against some of the best college players. Yes. And they lost that game. So I don't know. They didn't, lose. Their, they, lose game? they didn't lose. I thought they lost that game. They didn't lose. They won. They didn't lose any exhibition games. Mm-mm. I could have sworn they lost that game. I don't think they lost that game. I think okay. you're. I think you're. Crazy so then, where was the one. other? What was the other one that came from? You said USA's record was fifty four and two in exhibition. Yeah, they lost. So they, lost the they lost. They lost two. Uh, I'm gonna have to look, let me look that up. 
But okay. continue. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. So we'll see if that's right or not. That's fine. But all right. Despite that, I think that a big part of what this team is clearly missing and what they're not going to find in Kevin Durant is leadership. In the fourth quarter of this game, I mean, first of all, in the fourth quarter, KD shot poorly and then he hit a few threes towards the end. He's the one who kept them in it. He's the reason why they only lost by three, but they were just feeding him the ball, getting him to take all the shots. I understand that because of just his otherworldly offensive skill set. Right. But KD can't shoot this team into leadership. Leadership has to come from one of two places. I thought about this. It's either got to be Dame Lillard or my choice, Draymond Green, the most vocal individual, the heart and soul of a dynasty, of a former dynasty. And Draymond was all over the place in this game on defense, as you would expect him to be. I think Draymond Green has to assume leadership of this team. It's problematic because I don't know how much you can play him in the fourth quarter above like a Bradley Beal or somebody like that who can create their own shot. But they got to find leadership and they got to find it quick. Yeah, and that's that's the key thing is that they they need somebody to step up and take over and, and like you say, kind of lead them. Like right now, they're missing they're missing Devin Booker, Chris Middleton, Andrew Holiday, which I think adds an additional piece of leadership uh-huh. and a guy that doesn't give a damn that will go out there and just Drew do Holiday. It. That's a good one. <laughs> so you got you got. They have, I think Drew's a really good leader. Uh, I think Chris Middleton and Devin Booker going out there just balling yeah. will help them a lot. But I mean. Kevin loves Zach Levine, Jeremy Grant. I love Jeremy nope. Grant, but I don't think Jeremy Grant's an Olympian. Him, or, him or Kevin Love, they should not be on this team. Not yeah. for the reason that Jalen Rose talked about as far as Kevin Love, but those two players should not be on this team. They're good. I mean, Kevin Love's a champion. Jeremy Grant, he's just starting to come into his own, but they should not be on this team. They, yeah, that's, that's They said, who wants part. to play? They raise their hands. They're one of the first few to raise their hands. That's why they're on this team. Ooh. I, ooh. <laughs> so what do you think they're going to do? How are they going to do in the next game against Australia? Uh, which is tonight as we record this. I think they'll win. I predict a win by, we'll say, 15 to 20. They'll pull away late. But some of the issues that they showed in that first exhibition game are going to be there in this game as well. Now, at the same time, I don't know who leads that Australia team. If Matthew Delavadova is their best player and their leader, then it'll probably be by 50. But at the same time, like I said, if Australia knows how to shoot threes and space the floor and they make it into a three-point shooting contest, then we could be right back here again next week talking about another loss. Oh, yeah, that would be bad. Mm-hmm. That would be bad. And it looks like the Nigerian team was training in the Bay Area for like the last few weeks while this team basically got together Thursday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. They got together right before the holiday to play. Um, I'm looking to see. I don't see who all they lost to. I'm looking for the last time. I don't think it was in the 92. I, I know was. I know that they almost lost to the um, – was that the under twenty team or whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, that was when uh, Shea Seals went off and was cooking uh, Scotty Pippen that game. <laughs> um, that was a big. And that's part of what I'm saying. I don't. It may not have been an official exhibition game, but I really feel like they got they got beat by this younger team. And then after that, I mean, they they woke up already pissed off from the start and just blew everybody out in historic fashion. Yeah, that sounds. Uh, we'll see. Like the NBA team. So, mm-hmm. all right, let's give a check. All right, Jimmy. <laughs> Let's move into some fun conversations. I have been Cannot even excited about this. Yourself. I can't. So you, everyone knows that the NCAA had suspended their rules around uh, name, image, and likeness. Uh, I do have videos coming out this week. I need to do post editing on to put out. Talking about NIL, I've got some things about benefits of it, some things about the lies that we were told that were going to happen with it. Because it's been fun. It's been fun seeing the players get these deals. It's been fun hearing the stories behind them. There's even some... We need to do a segment talking about the best deals we've seen so far. Because there's some entertaining deals that have come out from this. But I wanted to do one specific thing around the NIL deals. Because it's so historic, July 1st being National Hustle Day that I have (laughs) um, self-proclaimed. Because that's when everybody's getting their hustle on. I want to talk about... What players in history would have probably made the most money if NIL existed? Now, there's some criteria I want you to consider because I know you curated a list. but I want you to think about some of this criteria that's going to be there. Now, of course, we're going to talk. We got to talk, of course, of course, men and women. A couple things to think about marketability. Mm -hmm. How big of a person were they in this time Mm -hmm. to be able to make? that kind of money um and lastly with a lot of our great selections that are going to come in here um 
years before, no social media presence. So that really plays into the how big of a deal were they in their time. So I'm going to let you start off and give us the first person that you think about. Now, this is not an f- official full list because we're mm-hmm. not going to be able to go in order because mm-hmm. there's so many people you're going to think about. You may even forget. You may name somebody I didn't think about. I've probably got like 40 people on here, <laughs> but I got it narrowed down to about five that I think would mm-hmm. probably eat on NIL. So, uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I've got a, I've got a top five list, and I've got a few honorable mentions. Uh, my number five on my list was Zion Williamson. Ooh, I didn't think about it that yeah, way. I think okay. just the the smile, the energy, just the old school raw power, all presented in social media fashion. Just as social media has just dominated the world, I think that's a big part of what would elevate him to being just one of the most marketable stars that we've ever seen in college sports. As a matter of fact, social media helped to create Zion in a sense because yes. before anybody ever knew who he was at Duke, people were talking about who is this high schooler who's like six foot nine, more powerful than Carl Malone, and just dunking on everybody. Who <laughs> is this guy? The funny thing about that, and I think what made Zion even bigger in social media was that more so the jokes around all he was doing was dunking on white Catholic boys. <laughs> right. Literally, that's what you really saw throughout yeah, yeah. social media. Talking about that, so like, ah, we don't know if this is going to translate. And then he got into at Duke, and you're like, oh, wait, this is going to translate. Then we mm-hmm. have to leave. You're like, oh, th- so this is what we're working with. Right. My bad. I, I missed out on the memo mm-hmm. that this dude was legitimately – this good, strong, powerful, and and have these type of abilities. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think he's that's a good option. Okay. Five for me. Yeah. It's kind of weird throwing this person at the five, but I think personality wise, that's the thing that jumped out to me would be the boss. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think of him. You are correct. Yeah, he, Brian Bosworth. He had it all. He had everything. Yeah. I mean, he was on the front of, you know, Sports Illustrated. Right. He was all over the place. The boss in this era with NIL, Man. let's delete social media. Just no social media in his era with NIL. Oh, my God. He'd been the most marketed dude ever. You'd see him on WWF and WCW <laughs> on a regular basis. He, he'd, he'd, do, he he'd be in Hey, he'd be in action films with Dwayne yes! the Rock Johnson. Yes, he would almost quit football because he made so much money outside <laughs> right. of. Why well, I got to do this? Why well, I got to do this mess? Yeah, but at the same time, hidden people, he's still getting paid. But no, he, I think he would have brought in all kinds of bread. That is a fantastic a selection. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Bosworth, Brian the Bosworth. boss. Okay, man, I'd have to reorder my. My list in high And I threw him at five. And like I said, yeah. this is not official in order list. This is just people I was thinking about because I've got way more than that. Mm-hmm. I do too. All right. So number four, I would say my number four was Peyton Manning. Ooh. Because of being NFL royalty, because of being thought of as he was supposed to be the greatest quarterback of all time. And if it weren't for someone named Thomas Edward Patrick Brady <laughs> the second, he would probably be considered Thomas the greatest Patrick. quarterback of all time. So NFL royalty, golden boy, all American, fantastic quarterback, blue blood program, Tennessee. Uh, he, he won a national championship, correct? Won a national championship. No, 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 he didn't. He, he didn't. actually, that the year after was T. Martin. Tennessee won. T. Correct. Martin led him, yes. Uh-huh. But Peyton Manning, I think, he would have there would he would have had a lot of corporate sponsorships yep. in a sense. I can you see know, that. Those types of businesses. So I would say Peyton Manning's my number four. Okay, okay. Mine next up, number four, I think would probably be a monster. And I think, to me, she would have been the top female mm-hmm. to bring in bread. Cheryl Miller. Mm. She, of course, went to television after playing the game. Mm-hmm. Olympian, monster on the court. Mm-hmm. I mean, we always, she always jokes about how she just destroyed her brother Reggie all the time. But Cheryl <laughs> was a beast in broadcasting. I remember watching highlights of her when I was younger you know, on the grainy TVs and everything uh, back in those days. But her as a broadcaster, I was so impressed just with her presence in doing that. Mm-hmm. I believe as a player, oh, she would have made, made the magic happen. Make mm-hmm. the magic happen. I, I think Cheryl Miller. I yeah. put her fourth on my yeah, list. That's that she probably killed selection. it. It's a real good selection. My number three. Now, there's someone I'm going to mention in honorable mentions who I could switch with this number three pick. Okay, but my number three pick would be Reggie Bush. Ooh, look at you. Yeah, who you know already in Los Angeles? What they call him, Jesus and cleats. And he was around the time where social media started to 
or it was birth in a sense, the early yes. 2000s. So I think he would have led the forefront really from the start to show you how you could use social media to market someone like him who was just insanely talented. Again, like Peyton Manning, he's thought of in college as the next great running back, as the greatest running back of all time, who's going to break all of Emmitt Smith and Barry Sanders records. And watching him play at USC, you would have believed it because he was that unbelievable as a player he is the most exciting player i think i had ever seen with my own two eyes in college football mm -hmm. and there was a few others out there that i could name that i loved like michael bishop and tommy frazier i mean santana moss peter ward i go down a list of players that i thought were electric this dude was ridiculously mm -hmm. good and like you said as he was coming right at the birth of social media back when facebook required you to have a edu email address to get an account <laughs> and they were slowly <laughs> adding schools around the country uh -huh. yes this dude had to, that dude was he was he was a monster okay so mm -hmm. it's actually a good choice would have loved to throw him at number three but reggie bush is one of my honorable mentions okay. i couldn't put him Fair above enough. the others mm -hmm. number three Johnny Manziel. Money oh. Manziel would have made so much bread like he already is. Oh. As people talk about how great he was in, 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 in college football. I think he was really good. He won Heisman for a reason. He yeah. was outstanding. But the biggest thing people talked about is how big he was in Texas. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's so much money in Texas. And boosters, they will find a way to give this man as much money as possible. <laughs> Even though he's already an old rich kid, mm -hmm. Money Manziel would have been everywhere and what's funny is, all you would have seen is this what's funny is he didn't have to go to the university of texas and be a longhorn to be as big as he was exactly that's, that's amazing that he did it at that texas school at a and m which is the second richest school in the state but kind of they think they're texas right <laughs> <laughs> that's basically it they think they're mm -hmm. texas mm -hmm. um they think they're as big as texas and they haven't given us any of that but i think money Manziel would have been been monstrous mm -hmm. Number two. Now, my number two, you're not going to see this one coming. I don't think you do. Everybody's going to see it coming. Here's my number two. Nope, you won't see this one coming. Number two, Christian Leitner. Why, you ask? Because he was the Tom Cruise of college basketball. Young, good-looking, cocky, champion. All the big sponsorships would have wanted him. He wouldn't have had to go into the NF, into the NBA because he would have had all these wonderful endorsements as a member of Duke. And this is in Duke's heyday when, what, he won two championships? Is that correct? Uh, I mean, this point. is when Duke basketball was at his best. And this is when college basketball was at his best. So Christian Leitner would have been that guy. Again, kind of like Peyton Manning, a lot of, I think the biggest sponsorships would have wanted him to represent their brand. Coke, Pepsi, Apple, whoever it was, they would all come after him. Christian Leitner would have been that guy. He was a consensus national player of the year in 92 and won back-to-back -back titles in 91-92 at Duke. Around so, yeah. the same time that Tom Cruise took over Hollywood. He was also Christian an Olympian. Leitner. He was the guy selected to be on the <laughs> dream Which is team. still weird to this day. They picked one college guy. I guess they felt like they needed to do it. Beard, mustache, bull. Anyway. <laughs> We'd rather deal with him than Isaiah. All right. Number two. Similar to you. Okay. Throwing out someone. Like a Christian Leitner, I think this man is football royalty, especially in the SEC. Everybody and their mama loves this guy. Um, I'm lying um, because a lot of people have a disdain for this guy, especially because he's still around. It's Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow would have made a killing like he already was there. Now, like, this is the thing about Tim Tebow and the one thing a little – bit that already rubbed me the wrong way about him. Tim mm -hmm. Tebow came from a pretty, you know, nice little privileged lifestyle. Right. And Tim always rails against the idea of paying players. He's anti it. He feels like that's just, that takes away from the sanctity of college football or whatever beard he likes to throw out there. Yeah. But if you go back and watch some of the interviews that Tim Tebow did back in those days, Tim Tebow had his own brand. Mm -hmm. And he was wearing shirts of his own brand in those interviews. Not school attire, Tim Tebow attire. Mm -hmm. So when you have the ability to do that, you can afford that and you have the connections to be able to do things like that kind of skews your viewpoint in what's going on. But Tim Tebow would have made a killing off of that brand immediately. People would have flocked straight to it. All the Christian uh, religious right. Oh yeah. Conservatives would have been all would have ate up everything. he had, Like they already <laughs> do today. They would have totally just bought into Tim Tebow and everything he had to offer at that point. And as a college student, he would have killed it. Mm -hmm. Yep. He, that's a really good one. That's a really good one. Um, and I know you're number one because your number one is the exact same as mine. Bo I guarantee it. Bo Jackson. Really? Bo Jackson. Wow. Yes. I was wrong. Unlike anything we have ever seen. I was wrong. 
You were wrong. I was wrong. It's I'm Bo wrong. Jackson. Okay. It, it Bo Jackson. Yours is Bo Jackson. He is. It's almost like you, you go back to the beginning of MJ. Just somebody who just looked completely different, who looked unlike anything we had ever seen before, and how MJ took his prowess on the basketball court and turned himself into his own market. Bo Jackson would have been able to do the exact same thing at Auburn. I mean, how I talked about, I mean, if Reggie Bush was Jesus in cleats, then Bo Jackson was his been, daddy. Was God? Was his daddy? Yeah. <laughs> like, was I, God? I made you. I sent you. I sent. I sent Reggie Bush I because you, I sent you to save college football. Yes. Yes, my son. I sent you uh-huh. to save college football. So that'd be my I number one. You. Is Bo Jackson? So before I say my number one, okay. I think I recognize what you did differently than I did. Okay. You went more in the realm of talent and marketability in that capacity. Mm. I went more to larger than life mm. people, mm-hmm. more that larger than people that were that transcended the actual game. So more like personality wise, right? Exactly, because like, you know who number one is, right? I don't know. Prime time, Deion <laughs> Sanders. There's nobody in college football that will make more money than Deion Sanders when he was at Florida State. The man, legend has it, the man went to the combine, ran the forty without without stretching. Ran out of there and said, my agent is in the back. <laughs> Got in a limo and left. Bounced. While they calculated it up and whatever the crazy number was. Mm-hmm. Deion Sanders, Mr. Primetime, was everything at Florida State. That man was college football in that day. And I don't think that, especially with his big personality he has today, mm-hmm. as, as, as much of a showman that he is, mm-hmm. I believe that as great of a player as Bo Jackson was, he could never surpass what Deion Sanders was on and off the mm-hmm. field. When I mentioned earlier that there was an honorable mention that I could swap out with Reggie Bush, it, it would have been Deion Sanders. I gave Bush the edge because of the era in which he came up through, the birth of social media, but... I mean, Deion Sanders being one, two, or three, no problem with that at all because of that larger-than-life personality that he still maintains to this day. So I totally understand that. Okay. Honorable mentions. What do you, you have? How, um, how many do you have? I've got, Let's run through some I, quick I ones. I can give you the names. I've got five of them. Um, okay. Tim Tebow was one of my honorable mentions. Deion Sanders was one of my honorable mentions. Uh, O.J. Simpson, who led the nation in Russia. Ooh, he, yeah. he is a big personality. Yeah, in L.A. So, I mean, and we saw just how marketable he was post post NFL career until all that trouble and stuff happened. So OJ Simpson, um one that was kind of interesting to me was Lou Alcinder as well at UCLA. Did he even lose a game at UCLA? <laughs> I mean, were, were they like 90 and 1? I think he did lose like one, one game, game, but he did yeah. win like every national mm-hmm. championship. They changed the rules. They called they had the Lou Alcinder rule. Did you yeah. hear about that? Where they wouldn't allow them to dunk? Yeah, no <laughs> because he was that dominant. Your finger touches that rim, your team's going to be thrown out of the arena. Yeah, because he was that dominant. Yes. And my last one was Candace Parker. And I really didn't know exactly why other than just how phenomenal she was. But what do you think about her? So let me give my five sure. because you're you're right there with me. My five in that era, I think, would have been ginormous in that um, as far as um, honorable mentions. Mm-hmm. is I did have Lou Alcinder as well. Okay. I think that he was someone to really consider. This was an interesting one that I, I wanted to ask you what you would think about Matt Leinard. Yes, yes. He was the he had the perfect California aesthetic he, and television of everything. You know, and I actually when I was thinking about Reggie Bush, I was thinking about Matt Liner because Matt Liner was all about Hollywood. Reggie Bush, yes. You know, they say he didn't really go out and party all that much, at least not while he was at USC. Matt Liner was totally about that life. Yeah, he was because because <laughs> Reggie Bush was flashy in the field. Matt Liner was flashy off the field. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> With that, so that's three. Um, that says those two. Um, Caitlin oh, uh, Ohashi, okay. the gymnast from UCLA that did the Michael Jackson, Michael oh, Jackson yeah, yeah, routine, yeah. they got the perfect 10. Yes. She had a per, – her personality and her social media following, of course, was just freaking uh-huh. ridiculous at that point that I feel like she would have really jumped and people would have jumped all over the opportunity to, to do stuff with her. Um, Rebecca Lobo mm-hmm. at UConn. She – Especially as they were beginning to transition into the W being created, mm-hmm. she was why one of the most marketable players in that list yes. of people. Her and Lisa Leslie. I think that mm-hmm. that's two that you can look at as well. And I'll throw a sixth one out there. Okay. 
because uh, they they didn't get as much love. They don't get as much love as they probably should, but Marion Jones. Yeah, she was a great basketball player. Yes, at UC, at UC, US, U, uh, UNC. She's in North yep. Carolina. She played in mm-hmm. North Carolina and ended up quitting to focus on the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And she was a monster on the court. She was. She was, just like uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey was. There you go. Yeah. I've exactly. Got, I'm going to throw this one out at you. What about, How about the Miami Hurricanes? The entire team. <laughs> I have them on my list. I have the entire Miami championship teams in the 80s. Yep. They, they would have been, they would have got market, they would have got Man. all kinds of people. Everybody, Michael would. Irvin, and just Man, just grit, they would've, baby. They would have yes. I mean, they somebody did, they would. Yeah, they I mean, did get paid. I mean, they, they have, of course they got no. paid. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> another one to throw out there before we wrap up, uh, Eric Dickerson. Yes, if you if you don't understand why I would say Eric Dickerson, go watch the Pony Excess. <laughs> <laughs> He's the reason why SMU got the death penalty, and even though yes. he doesn't want to admit to it, him and everyone else there were anything, basically yeah. on the state of Texas payroll. Mm-hmm. The governor was paying him money, mm-hmm. and they couldn't get out of it because they had contracts legally. Right. You pays me these money. <laughs> um, but I, and and last one I was thinking about to go along with that was well a couple more to think about probably like either Hope Solo and Mia Hamm. Mm-hmm. I think that they would have probably been pretty monstrous in the uh, marketing uh, uh, out there on the soccer field. So I think so. I think so. And I think you know in in the comments, um, especially if you watch this on YouTube, give us what would be like your top five the the top five money earners you think in the history of college sports who just would have cashed in during this time. Yep. And don't worry about putting them in the exact order. Yeah. Just give us five more people. Give us people to think about because I feel like this will be a fun discussion. Going forward, because there's so many people you yeah. could choose I'm from. There's so many people I couldn't even think of, probably. Mm-hmm. I, I know there's a ton of people I couldn't think of. Like, I was looking at, like, Santana Moss and Peter Warwick. They were super flashy mm-hmm. return men back in those days. I was like, oh, no, 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 those are probably fringe guys. They probably make some money. But as far as high earners, I know I'm missing someone on the women's side. Mm-hmm. I know I'm missing someone outside of um, the, the big sports football, basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, hell, it's probably a baseball player I'm not even thinking about that I probably should be thinking about. But they got, they said they, they went pro. <laughs> right, right, King right. Griffey Jr. Went pro, he can go to college. Right, get that stuff. Won't waste my time. So, yeah, hit us up in the comments. Let us know what you think. So, you know, uh, Jay, how much I enjoy list. Yeah, you love list. I hate them. A em. big part of the reason is because a lot of a lot of the list I see are are so bad, and that's probably part of the reason why you hate them. But I think lists are interesting. Every list tells a story in a sense. Sometimes it's a bad story that the list tells. So, on ESPN, they released their. I believe this is an annual list. Of their top 10 quarterbacks, they surveyed um, more than 50 league executives, coaches, scouts, and players. I don't know what ratio was what, or if they did 50 per category, like per play, per the players, whatever. But they released their top 10 list. So the top 10 list is as such, according to ESPN, okay. with the people that they talked to. Number one, Patrick Mahomes. Number two, Aaron Rodgers. Number three, Tom Brady. Number four, Russell Wilson. Number five, Josh Allen. Or Jaheim, as you call him. <laughs> Number six, Matthew I Stafford. Stole that one, yeah. Yeah, six, Matthew Stafford. Number seven, Dak Prescott. Number eight, Lamar Jackson. Number nine, Justin Herbert. And number 10, Kyler Murray. So that is the top 10 list, according to ESPN. Now, having said that, do you see any problems, either any problems with this list or anything that they definitely got right? Okay, so one problem I do have, and um, Titans fans, I'm going to defend you. <laughs> I do think Ryan Tannehill, as of right now, should be moved up. He had two back-to-back solid seasons in 2019 and 2020. And he looks like, uh, even at his age, he looks like um, he's still he's still really, really good. He's just not elite. But I think he's good enough to be in the top 10 ranking. And the one that I would probably pull out right now would be Justin Herbert. I think Justin Herbert's a little too high today. I would probably move Tannehill to nine just above Kyler Murray only because of his what he's done getting them into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, so Tannehill would definitely be one I would switch. Uh, Herbert I would drop down, but I love I love Justin Herbert. I think that he is going to – he's big, strong. I, I like the uh, – somebody said – one of the quotes in here says, big as hell, looks like Megatron. A Pro Bowl <laughs> running back said that of the six foot six, 237-pound passer. He's going to be a factor for a long time. That's exactly what I feel like. I feel like, I feel like Justin Herbert is what um, I wished uh, Josh Allen was when he came into the league. Mm-hmm. Big, strong – 
but knows how to make the proper decisions. Mm-hmm. Josh Allen feels like he's a little high too. I think Josh Allen may need to be dropped down. A, but I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I like Josh Allen. You don't want, you don't want Bill's mafia. Bill's coming mafia will be all over my foot. They, they will be because it's because I made the joke. But no, I like uh, I like Josh Allen here at five. Um, as well, I think that they got it right from one through five. Um, as much as I love Russell Wilson, I might switch him and Josh Allen. Mm. And I only would switch him because when you let Russ cook too much, he overcooks everything. <laughs> and that's usually the bad things that happen. That's why the team doesn't perform. He's got elite receivers. His line is always questionable, but he has elite receivers. And he has a tendency of holding the ball too long, just like Josh Allen, which is the one problem I've always had with him is Josh Allen. And they made the comment in here, which I thought was spot on with them. He's super competitive. He always wants to make the play, which means he holds the ball for too long. And he does stupid stuff that mm-hmm. always turns into bad things for his team. Mm-hmm. I would I would probably have him I probably would switch him. I probably make him four over Russell Wilson, move Russell Wilson to five until I can see Russell Wilson not um overcook everything. Mm-hmm. What you what, what what you have initially. Got some huge problems with this list. Oh man. Huge problems with this list. Oh man, oh man, oh man. Starting with uh number one. Um Patrick Mahomes being the best quarterback in the NFL. Why isn't Tom Brady number one? When he beat both Patrick Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers in the playoffs this past season. Now you could say, well, because he's never had anywhere near the arm talent as both of those quarterbacks, which is true, but arm talent does not a number one quarterback make. That is not that is not always the case. And obviously I know how great Patrick Mahomes is and how great Aaron Rodgers is, but only of those three, of the top three, only one has truly mastered the position of quarterback. Yes, in virtue of the fact that he's 63 years old and he's still playing and he's seen it all and he's done it all. But I don't see how you could put with especially the season that he had. He didn't have a whack season at the age of 43. He still had over 4000 passing yards and what was it over 30 or over 40 touchdown passes last season. So I don't see how in virtue of that you put Tom Brady third to those two when he has beaten them and routinely beats Aaron Rodgers, it seems. Who cannot <laughs> figure out a way past him? <laughs> he really can't. I know way yeah. past him. So at those I think times. Tom Brady should have been number one. Oh wow! Yeah, I do. I I I, I can't put Tom at number one only because uh, twofold. One, I feel like Tom Brady plays better when he feels like he's been slighted, and I need Tom Brady <laughs> to be slighted so that we can get a back to back Super Bowl. Nah, I, mean, I would feel great. He'll find it somewhere. MJ always found it. Get, he'll find it. Yeah, yeah. To get that slight, and also Tom Brady's becoming so much more likable nowadays. Mm-hmm. Two over the last few years, he's doing very well with social media. He does yeah. he does that really well, and he's just, he's he's more fun. So I need him to feel slighted and feel upset. Um, he's already found it, Jay. You saw the episode. You're sticking with that mother, <laughs> <laughs> which is still there hilarious. It is. That's, it. that's that's a good point. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, 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 no. This list is his slight. Now there you go. He's looking that's at it my the same point. way I do. Like what? That's my point. <laughs> he's three. If you put him number one, you're gonna be like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Then he's and then he's forty three year old, just settled. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I needed him to feel slighted, and this is the perfect way of him being slighted, being number three, okay. especially behind Aaron Rodgers, which. Yeah. I like Patrick Mahomes at number one. Fair enough. But Aaron Rodgers might have, might, I mean, the way that he plays, he probably mm-hmm. should be number one. <laughs> yeah. Aaron Even though has, he hasn't picked did. up a football since that game. You know, Aaron Rodgers has not touched a football since that game. Does he have to? And I'm supposed to believe, yes. I'm supposed to believe. Did you think he, he just, picked up a football the year before? When what? When yeah. he won the MVP? Yeah, I mean, he was in a, a much different space than he is now. I don't think so. But right, right, because he was slighted, right? He was slighted that season, primarily because Matt LaFleur took the ball out of his hands, in a sense. Last year, he was rated number three. He had something to prove. Uh-huh. Last year, Tom Brady was rated number seven. Yeah. Hmm. Patrick Mahomes, of course, goes from one to one. <laughs> one to one. Because <laughs> there's no reason yeah. why you would. Well, the thing about it is, is that every all the, the numbers that Mahomes has put up and the way he's played, Unbelievable. there's no reason for you to think that anybody else is actually better than him. I mean, you have him as your quarterback. You're a Super Bowl contender, period. Mm-hmm. Period. Any team. Throw him on any, you throw him on Detroit right now, they're Super Bowl contenders. But you could say the same thing about Tom Brady. I, I don't think so. Well, like, I don't you're think saying, so. You're saying any team, Patrick Mahomes could lead more teams to the Super Bowl than Tom Brady. Right now, yes. I mean, you might have an argument with that. Uh, that would be an interesting debate. I'm not sure that that's true. But I just don't see, after 
after, and I know there were other factors to this, but I mean, he beat the guy. So it's like if you take someone who, because because Chris, our barber is like this. If you take somebody who goes strict, who sees things strictly through the prism of winning, he could never accept this because he said he just beat both of them. I guarantee you, that's what he would say. Exactly, and right. and I get that. I I get that argument. I can't even go against it because he did. He won my your team, years, yeah, a Super Bowl, which yeah. I'm really happy about. You're but right. I think it's more to I put like this: the team was perfectly constructed for Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. They had already had elite receivers. They already had elite tight ends, or re- really, or really good tight ends. Yeah. Um, they didn't have a running game, which was the biggest struggle, and the offensive line needed some work in which they drafted and mm-hmm. got a better offensive line. They added pieces to the offensive line, but the defense was already ridiculously good, and they just yeah. added more components to that defense to make mm-hmm. that defense so much better. Then they brought in Tom Brady and slipped it in there. Mm-hmm. That's the thing about it when it comes to Tom. No shade to Tom, but his Super Bowl teams in New England – had great defenses. Generally, yeah. They agree, basically the defense helped the offense, and the mm-hmm. offense helped the defense. Now against the Packers, Tom didn't help his defense <laughs> throwing them three interceptions. And I'm gonna keep bringing that up. I'm bringing it up every time. That's totally he true. threw it on three straight up possessions. Totally true. That to me was disturbing. That bothered me. Right. That bothered me. And the only reason why it was it worked for him was that that defense was able to keep Aaron Rodgers from capitalizing, mm-hmm. which I don't think I was all Aaron. I think it was more Lafleur's play calling, probably. But. But either way, they were able to save the day. But either way, if because how well, how many points did he even get out of those three turnovers? Were like three? They, like, no, 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 I'm saying the defense yeah. stopped. But the, still, if if but you, you can't put your say, defense, yeah, no, compromising but, positions but, like that, but but, you, but Aaron Rodgers can't get away with that. If people are saying you may be the greatest quarterback who has ever played talent wise, then you can't get spotted three turnovers in a playoff game in the second half on your own home field and do absolutely nothing, nothing with it. it. I agree. I, yeah. No, you're, you're not wrong nah, in that. Here's another thing. To me, here's a bigger problem. Bigger problem is Matthew Stafford. Why is he on this list? <laughs> which Matthew Stafford are we talking about? Are we talking about Detroit Lions Matthew Stafford, which is all he's ever been, or are we talking about – what is going to be L.A. Rams, Matthew Stafford, who we expect to have over 4,500 passing yards with Sean McVay, at least 35 passing touchdowns. Is that how we're viewing him? Because when I look at this list, I don't think there's any GM who would take or say that he is better than Dak, Lamar, Herbert, maybe Murray, but at least not those three. So if he is on this list, he is way too high. He should be 10. He should be he should be maybe number nine. And you, if you left if you left K1 right where he is. So I don't like Matthew Stafford being on this list, period. I'm like, I'm not saying he's a bad quarterback. He's a good quarterback, still has a really good arm, and I think he's going to do really good things, unfortunately, in, my, in the division with my 49ers as a member of the Rams. But I do not put him against the, the first three behind him. I want to know which Matthew Stafford they were looking at and talking about. Well, everybody's always been high on Matthew Stafford, and everybody's excuse for Matthew Stafford is that he plays he's in, in Detroit. Detroit. Okay. So I, I believe that's what it is. And they think that if you put him with Sean McVay, he's going to do just magical things because at that point, Sean McVay doesn't actually have to be the quarterback. <laughs> he can actually just be the offense, the head coach and offensive coordinator and let his quarterback actually play quarterback. Um, I do think that I, I, in listening to you, I do believe that Matt Stafford's a little high. He probably should be down to 10 or he should be actually 11 and let Tannehill take the spot and move Perfectly up. fine with that. Yeah. Um, the Dak just, well, they bumped Dak up two spots, especially he's coming off of an injury where we're, we're curious to what he's going to look like off of a, I mean, it's an ankle injury mm-hmm. for a quarterback that doesn't always scramble. That's more of a pocket passer. I don't right. think that, I don't know how he's going to be able to react as far as throwing the ball and pushing off of that leg when it's going down the field. I don't know. Um, I like where Dak's at. I think Lamar may be dropped. I think he could probably be dropped down from eight to about nine mm-hmm. um, only because his offense hasn't – they haven't put anything around him nor put together a system where Lamar can just throw the ball like he needs to. Mm-hmm. They they have always focused on being a power run offense – when, and let 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 Lamar cook. Um, if they they got some receivers, so I think they'll be able to let Brown uh, Hollywood be able to really be the burner, and then we'll see what the rest of the receiver corp can give him. What do you think about this? Um, let's say okay, much of this in terms of where they place on this list was based on their performance last season. So let's say that's the case. If that's okay. the case, why isn't Justin Herbert ahead of Lamar Jackson? 
or should he be ahead of Lamar Jackson? Because let's <clears> say <throat> they presented this list and they actually had – I wouldn't put him ahead of Prescott because Prescott can do a lot of what he does or he does a a lot of what Prescott does, I'll say. So if you move Prescott to the six, if they had Herbert at seven, um, Lamar at eight, say K1 at nine, maybe Stafford or Tannehill at 10, I mean, that might have helped the list somewhat. But would you have a problem with that if they moved Herbert ahead of Lamar Jackson? I would, mainly because we've only seen one year of of him. And so his rookie year was fantastic. And you know what always happens after the rookie year? Sophomore slump. There you go. We, teams have film on him now, and they can actually be better prepared. And, they re- and they're going to recognize one thing about him. He's big as hell, looks like Megatron, <laughs> and he's hard to take down, which means that he probably will make the mistake of trying to make plays that he shouldn't make, a la Josh Allen. Mm-hmm. If they get him to do that, they may be able to curb him for one season. Long term, Justin Herbert's going to be in this league for years as long as knock on wood, he stays healthy. Mm-hmm. Period. He's going to be a factor for years, um, especially being big and that big and strong like he is, and being able to scoop like he can. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Kyler probably is the one. If anybody should be top ten, I would probably move Kyler and actually Kyler and Matt Stafford out. Now, at the end of that list, they had other quarterbacks who received honorable mentions. Yeah, honorable mentions. We read that list. Yes. Okay. Before I do that, Justin Herbert's highest rating was six. So people. Some evaluators mm-hmm. did like him. He didn't get no okay. top five right. votes, so but see, a lot of so people so I'm not did. Way, I'm not way off a lot of then. people did like him up in the six to uh-huh. ten range, so it's not good. So here's the ones that received votes that did not make it up there: Matt Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if these are like if these people are just pulling out Kyler Murray and putting in who they thought was a better guy, okay, that's what that is. All right, uh, Matt Ryan. Derek Carr. <laughs> <laughs> wow, why are you laughing? That's so mean. I'm sorry. I like Derek Carr, but no, not that much. Uh, ben Roethlisberger. Oh my god. Ryan Tannehill. Okay. Go Joel down. Burrow. No. Absolutely not. Kirk Cousins. Was this Minnesota's GM who said that? Absolutely. That's the one vote he got was a Minnesota vote. And NFC no. executive said this. He's a good player. He's easy to nitpick, but he's productive and great for that system. Yep, Minnesota GM. Yeah, great for our, I mean, uh, that system. That, that one, you know, yep. that one, the one that, th- that thingy. Yep. Um, Baker Mayfield. No. So someone, uh, AFC scout said they could see him getting into that DAC class eventually. He doesn't have all the athletic tools of some of the other quarterbacks, but he's developing into a good passer, in mm-hmm. which he's actually getting a little bit more accurate. He's looking, he's looking, he's, he's not taking as many risks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the last one, which I thought this was pretty funny, but I guess as we go through this 10s, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, this is the 18th player in the league they consider mm-hmm. Carson Wentz. That was Frank Reich who said that he wanted, he wanted Carson Wentz to read this list and feel like he should be higher, but feel like there's at least one person out there who does believe in him. And that's Frank Reich. He's the only one who believes in him. It says uh, NFL, a veteran NFL offensive player says that him being in a different environment might help him. Back, get back to who he was. Mm-hmm. I don't know if uh, <laughs> Prince Harry has the ability to get Carson back to who Wentz. he thought. So, uh, so looking at that S18, so we've got another, what, 12, 14 players that uh-huh. got basically uh, axed. That includes Jared Goff. Yes. They didn't put Deshaun Watson on there because of everything that's going on in his world. So uh-huh. that lit, top 10 list would include him if he didn't have everything crazy I mean, in his background. If it were Deshaun Watson, he's battling Russell Wilson and Josh Allen for that four or five. Oh, yeah. 100%. 100%. Mm-hmm. The numbers he put up, the percentages, he, uh, the completion percentages he put up. Passing with, yards leader. Yes, with no real help. Like, if you really think of the receiver corp, who did he really have? Um, no run game consistent. Exactly. So I do believe that he would definitely be in the top 10 if, if things weren't going. Oh, on the way that they're going on right now. So, um, trying to think. Uh, yeah, Jared Goff was, of course, left off. They <laughs> left off Tua, which makes sense. You Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy Garoppolo's left off. Thank you for playing. Cam Newton was left off, uh-huh. which we don't know what he looks like yet. He's got a full season. He's got mm-hmm. a full off season and off season underneath that Patriots system. I think he'll be a different. You have to say Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill. Yep, Tameis, Taysom Hill and Jason. <laughs> yep, they're both Sam out Darnold. of there. Darnold's Thank not you on for there. Playing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the list outside of your rookies are yeah. yeah it's it's a lot of players that did not. Daniel Jones will call you in three years if you're still around. <laughs> Ryan Fitzpatrick. <laughs> it's magic, we'll see, baby. We'll see you at the barbecue. All right. <laughs> You're always... I don't think he's even invited to the barbecue. Uh, yeah, he is. Oh, he's, he's more fun than just about anybody. That's true. Good point. Yep. All right. So, Jimmy. Yes. So, on our editing room floor. Editing room floor. All right. So, check this out. Your boy, John Wall, your favorite point guard in the history of basketball, um, liked an article suggesting a trade 
for him um, by the Los Angeles Clippers. So he likes that. He would rather be in L.A., we'll say. So um, do you like this trade of Houston trading John Wall to the Clippers? I do. Mm-hmm. Who do you like it for? Who who they get? I mean, well, not not four, but who do you do you like this for Houston or do you like this for the Clippers? Um, I think it's good for Houston. I think it's great for the Clippers because it just makes everything even more dysfunctional for me. I love it. <laughs> he can't shoot. He, he can't shoot. He cannot be on this team. For the Rockets, I think there's a bit of a youth movement going on, or at least there should be a little bit. It is a youth movement, so they probably are going to try to move him in that massive contract that he has. But I don't know what kind of takers they're going to be. If the Clippers got desperate enough and Balmer. Just wanted to play NBA 2K and say whatever. They might do something like this. It would make sense. Yeah. It's a good move. To be honest, I think it would be a good move for them. Just would be a, need a weird guard. fit. But this is only after you secure Kawhi Leonard as a member of this team. Because, I mean, I don't know. That I mean, if, be, if you don't, just give John Wall and Paul George together. Yeah. That would will, be actually entertaining. Well, will John Wall be a Rocket next season? Oh, no, no, no. They got to get rid of him. Yep. Nope. Get young. Move on. Yep. All right. Up next. So the Washington football team, um, who are in the process of choosing their name and a sense, their brand, has said that one name that they won't be adopting is that of the Warriors. Yep. Because they don't want any name with any association whatsoever with uh, Native Americans or Native American culture. Um, do you think that's going too far by Xing out the name Warriors? No, I don't think it is at all. Um, there was a thread going on, Bomani Jones had going on Twitter that uh, that that a lot of people feels like they just did not get it. Um, most of the Warriors names that were created were based upon Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Like even think about it, Golden States. They were the Philadelphia Warriors. The mascot was a Native American person as a mascot, mm-hmm. Indian. Um, then they moved to San Francisco, changed it, and then they completely got a, got rid of all of that Native American uh, yeah. background. A lot of te- other schools at the same teams did the same thing. They had mm-hmm. the Warriors. That was what the Warriors meant. It was about that. You know why they got this right? Because Dan Snyder no longer runs the day to day operations. His Good wife point. was clearly much smarter than him. Runs it. Okay, fair enough. All right, uh, next one. You're not going to see this one coming at all. All right, so Matt Damon, um, not one of my favorite actors at all. I've seen quite a few of his movies. But um, he was talking about um, Avatar, how originally he was offered the lead role in Avatar that ultimately went to Sam Worthington. And in payment, they offered him 10% of the profits of Avatar, which, as you know, he declined. So Avatar went on to make over $2 billion, which 10% of that equates to $200 million. Now, Matt Damon has a net worth of one hundred and fifty million. But if you had one fifty, but you turned down essentially two hundred million, will you just quit acting? Period. Oh yeah, turning down two hundred million dollars. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was. I would be like, I can't trust my decision making any longer as an actor. I should go do something else. I should go write scripts and just enjoy my one hundred fifty million dollars or direct. But uh. Yeah, that's got to be hard. And you know who else turned down a major role? Will Smith. He turned down the role of Neo in Matrix. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. That's a hell of a lot Got a bonus one here. Um, the Orlando Magic announced their new head coach was former Mavericks assistant Jamal Mosley. Yes. So he's going to lead this team. Now, do you know much about him? Not really. I heard that I've around the circles and a lot of uh, media people that I follow on the bird, a lot of people vouched heavily for him as a coach. So mm-hmm. I'm assuming that he's going to be good. We'll mm-hmm. see what it looks like. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, another minority coach, and I've never actually seen his face before. So I'm assuming, just in virtue of the first name, that he will say isn't Caucasian. I could say he's probably black, but is he? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Jamal Murray? Jamal Mosley. Mo- sorry, Mosley. Yeah. Yes, he's like maybe Murray one day. Okay, good, good, good. So yeah, so you know, another another black head coach, another minority head coach, I think is, is always fantastic for the league, nine times out of ten. Um, so I hope he does well there. I just I just still see Orlando as a wasteland. It's like what the Cleveland Browns job used to be. I mean, no, hardly any free agents want to come there. No resources. It just seems like bad management. So hopefully, however this turns out for him, he will still be eligible for another job, a better job after this, and that they won't sink his entire reputation as a coach. I agree with you there. Yep. All right. <laughs> Jamal Mosley, you black. You black him up. <laughs> All right. We appreciate y'all joining us as usual here on Unfair Sports. Make sure you check us out on our site and check us out on YouTube, unfair-sports.com, and hit the YouTube button. Make sure while you're there, like and subscribe. While you're out there, um, listen to us on the podcast, rate us, review us, and give us five stars. You think we deserve it? Man, just give us five anyway. Gifted. Gifted. Uh, so for Mike, Bob, and Winnie, thank you so much for doing what you do best. And so for my co-host, Jimmy, um, 
Hit us up on the fan line, 430-901-1906, and uh, give us your opinions. Or leave us a comment and a reply on either Facebook, Instagram, or on YouTube. Just go to unfair-sports.com. That's where you will find all of the syndications. And with that, we'll chop it up with y'all in a few days. Peace. Peace.